السنة مثل سفينة نوح من ركبها نجا ومن تركها غرق الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد As to what proceeds Firstly I would like to greet Our fellow students With the Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Secondly I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That the month that has just passed Which was the month of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted your qiyam as well as your siyam. And that the month of Ramadan was a blessed month for all of you and a month in which you got closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, once again, it gives me great honor that once again, I am here united on Instagram with my students to continue studying the book, uh, the Madhab of Ahlul Hadith, by the line of his time, Sheikh Al Islam Abu Al Wafa, Sanaul Amr Sadi Rahmatullah Ali, the teacher of Sheikh Al Arab Al Ajam, Badiuddin Al Sindi Al Rashidi, or Rahimahullah Taala. And when having a glimpse through the book, Alhamdulillah. We have studied almost half of the book and we are now, as we say, Ashatur al Thani or at the second part of the book. So, this chapter is a very important chapter. Sheikh al Islam Abu al Wafa Sanawala Amrit Sari Rahmatullah Ali, he wrote a whole book uh, in relation to Taqlid Shaksi or particularly following a, blindly following a madhab, in refutation to the great Diabandi scholar, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thani, who wrote a book in defense of taqlid. The great Diabandi scholar uh, who wrote this book, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thani, was refuted by many Salafi scholars, and from amongst them was Sheikh al-Islam Abu al-Fasa Nawala Amrit Sari, his Risala, as he mentions in his book, when he talks about this issue, is his Risala is called Ijtihad wa Taqlid. Risala is called Ijtihad wa Taqlid, and I have read this Risala, and it is an amazing Risala, where the Sheikh brings al adillatul Aqliya and Naqliya, where he brings rational as well as evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah, and abolishes the arguments that are brought forward by Mulana uh, Ashraf Ali Thami from amongst the Diyamandis. So the Sheikh in his book, The Mother of the Ahl al-Hadith, he only touched on the subject very briefly. And when reading through this chapter and making notes, I found that this chapter is so beneficial that if a student of knowledge was to understand this chapter as the Sheikh has explained it, he will save himself from a lot of trouble and a lot of the fitna that is happening currently in the West. But in reality, do people blindly follow their teachers and their sheikhs? Or is it that when they follow the haq and people can't answer them, they accuse them of blindly following their teachers? So without any further ado, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we seek his aid and his assistance. And we, we shall now start this chapter known as At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi means blindly following a particular fiqh madhab This is a terminology So whenever you hear the word At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi it means to blindly follow one of the four imams At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi 
And the madkhal with regards to this chapter is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as reported by Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma in a hadith collected by Al-Bukhari in his Sahih that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Buniya al-Islamu ala khamsin shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah Islam has been built upon five pillars and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the first pillar where he mentioned it to be the shahad the witnessing or the testimony of a person with his tongue where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that a person testifies or witnesses or bear witnesses that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Ahlul Ilm or the Ulama, they say that the first pillar of Al-Islam, the Shahada, has two components. The first component is La ilaha illallah, which is Tawheed al ibad The second component is Tawheed al risal which is wa anna muhammad rasulullah the first component which is la ilaha illallah the ahlul ilm or the ulama they say that the meaning of la ilaha illallah that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except allah is it means la ma'buda bi haqqin illallah and with regards to wa anna muhammad rasulullah the Ahlul Ilm, they say, لا متبوع إلا برسول الله that The only one that deserves to be followed absolutely is no one other than Muhammad Rasulullah. This second component of the first pillar of Al-Islam, which is the Shahada, which every single Muslim has to testify, has been mentioned or explained by the scholars as Tawheed al-Risala or Tawheed al-Ittiba scholars such as Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala have mentioned this and others they say that Tawheed al-Risala that the first is al-Ibadah the first component of the Shahada is al-Ibadah and the second component of the Shahada is al-Risala al-Ibadah with al-Risala completes the first pillar of al-Islam. So a person cannot fulfill the first pillar of al-Islam until he or she, if they do any actions, their actions are done solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, that the person who does any actions, he has to absolutely follow Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is with regards to Tawheed al-Ittiba or Tawheed al-Risal. And the mas'ala of Taqlid is, which Taqlid is known as blind following, is related to Tawheed al-Risal. After understanding this, then we need to know that Taqlid is of two types. At-taqlid al-mutlaq, which is generally blindly following somebody, without restricting yourself to any particular madhab. So this is known as at-taqlid al-mutlaq. The second category of at-taqlid, of blind following, is at-taqlid al-muqayyad or which is known also as At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi, which is to restrict your blind following. That a blind follower follows somebody who he considers to be his Imam, and he blind follows him in everything that that Imam says, regardless of whether that opinion is correct or incorrect. This is known as At-Taqlid al-Shakhsi. Or At-Taqlid Al-Muqayyid. With regards to At-Taqlid, then At-Taqlid 
in the Arabic language, as I have mentioned before, when we have touched upon this issue, is that a taqlid in the Arabic language refers to something which is worn by a four-legged animal around his neck. Balad. Something which is tied around, a leash that is tied around a dog's neck, the qalada, this is known as a taqlid. That when a, the master of the dog, when he puts a leash around the dog's neck and the dog follows him in everything, then <clears throat> this is known as a taqlid. So taqlid is generally used in the linguistic sense. It's used for something that is tied around a cattle or a four-legged animal's neck and that uh, animal then follows uh, the master. This is the meaning of at-taqlid in the Arabic language, linguistically or lughatil. At-taqlid with regards to its technical meaning or istilah, then it refers to as, as agreed upon by the Hanafi scholars of Usul, they are in agreement that taqlid refers to al-amalu bi qawli al-ghayri min ghayri hujjah. That to follow the opinion of another person uh, without knowing its evidence or without it being based upon evidence. So this is known as uh, al-taqlid. Al-Taqlid istilahan, or technically as defined by the Usuliyun in general, and the scholars, or the Hanafi scholars in particular. And the reason of why we quote the Hanafi scholars mm -hmm. is that our dispute with regards to the issue of Taqlid uh, is with regards to the Hanafis in general. So Al-Taqlid is of two types. التقليد المطلق and التقليد المقيد التقليد المطلق is to blindly follow any scholar that you wish but you blindly follow him التقليد is of two types التقليد المطلق and التقليد المقيد أو التقليد الشخصي التقليد المطلق is the general type of تقليد the unrestricted type of تقليد which is to blindly follow any scholar you see fit. Not bothering of whether the evidence of that scholar is correct or incorrect. At-taqlid al-shakhsi or at-taqlid al-muqayyad is to restrict yourself by blindly following a particular scholar or imam and not exiting or abandoning any of his opinions. At-taqlid in the Arabic language means something which is tied around the neck of an animal. Usually referred to as the leash, the qalada, which is tied around a dog's neck and then that the dog follows his master or his keeper and follows him wherever the keeper goes. Regardless of if the keeper was to fall inside a hole, then the dog would follow him and fall inside that hole. The categories which I have mentioned to you naam, can be found in the books of Usul al-Fiqh by the ulama. When the word taqlid is usually used or applied, it usually refers to blind following a fiqh madhab, a madhab which is related to fiqh issues, subsidiary issues or furu. It is referring to what? Issues that are related to fiqh, tahar, ibadah. Mu'amalat, etc. This is the word taqlid is usually used for this. It's restricted meaning, the ma'hud meaning of the word taqlid will always refer to when the ulama in their books or the fuqaha, the jurists that write on this, they will usually discuss this issue in relation to issues of fiqh. Now, so the sheikh in his book, the chapter heading which he talked about or the category of taqlid which he talked about is a taqlid al-mutlaq or a taqlid al-shakhsi, which is that a person blindly follows one of the famous scholars or one of the famous imams 
of one of the famous four madhabs, the Hanifi, Shafi, Maliki, or Hanbali, and restricts himself of blindly following everything that that Imam has said, whether it's correct or incorrect, etc. This is what the Sheikh talks about. So the Sheikh, he says, by starting his book, he says that uh, according to the general view of the Muslims, the usul that the Muslims have are for Quran, number one, Hadith, number two, Ijma' of the Muslim Ummah, number three, and the Qiyas of the Mujtahid, number four. The first two are agreed upon, and the last two have been disputed. Then the Sheikh mentions and he says, that which is amongst the first usul that the Muslims refer back to is the Qur'an. But when we want to derive a ruling related to uh, issues of fiqh, then we first refer back to the Qur'an and then we refer back to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we refer to the athar of the Sahaba, Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'i. Then the Sheikh said, then we refer to the Arabic language. So first we refer to the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the athar of the Sahaba. And then we refer to the following sciences. And the Sheikh, he mentioned quite a few of them. He mentioned the Arabic language. He mentioned the rules of Nahwa and Sar. He mentioned Ilm al Ma'ani, which is also another, and Bayan, which is also another form of the Arabic language. And then he mentioned Usul al Fiqh and others. He said that these disciplines have been documented and have been uh, preserved or have been learned by the people and the students of knowledge in order for them to be a means to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So the reason of why these disciplines were put into subjects and documented and written and explained and that they became independent sciences was for only one purpose. But every single science that we see or discipline that we see which is related or connected back to the to Al Islam, it was only for the reason of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah. Only understanding the Quran and the Sunnah. All these sciences that we have within us, Nahwa, Sarf, Balagha, Usul al Fiqh, they were all introduced and documented by the people of knowledge in order for us to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. That because in order for us to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah, these disciplines were introduced so that one may be able to understand the Qur'an and Sunnah through these disciplines. And he said that, for instance, or for example, if we were unable to understand an issue, and because of our knowledge being very little, and because of us not having the ability to understand a particular issue, then if we saw that the Ummah, the Muslim Ummah had agreed upon a particular issue, then in that circumstance we would take the ijma or the consensus of the Muslim Ummah and go by that. So if any other issue we were not able to find clear evidence, but we found that the ulama had agreed upon, the Muslim ummah had agreed upon this, then we would follow that. Then the shaykh goes on to particular, and then he goes on to say, he says, if there is an issue where we can't find explicit evidence, I remember the word explicit, from the Quran and the Hadith and the Athar of the Sahaba and the Salaf, and we cannot find that the Muslim ummah also is united upon that issue, then 
we will refer to a mujtahid who will exercise his judgment with the conditions that are binding upon him and then when he will come to a conclusion we may follow that opinion so this is what the sheikh said and he said that this is exactly what the ahlul hadith in general believe in that the ahlul hadith they generally from their principles accept the quran and the hadith and the ijma of the sahaba and they also accept that if a mujtahid or an alim was to exercise an independent judgment with regards to an issue which may be a contemporary issue based upon the principles of ijtihad that he is able to exercise his ijtihad and then if he was to derive a judgment upon that that does not contradict the quran or the sunnah or any other principle then his fatwa or his position or opinion will be accepted one of the things that the sheikh said he mentioned that uh, the ahlul hadith of those who follow the quran and the sunnah the quran and the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they are slandered or a hate word that is always used for them is ghair muqallid this is a word in the urdu language that you will see the blind followers when they want to mock us and belittle us they will use the word ghair muqallid or they will use the word wahhabi but more, more commonly now they use the word ghair muqallid the word wahhabi is used more with regards to beliefs and the word ghair muqallid is used more with regards to subsidiary or fiqh issues so this is a word which is used by in the subcontinent and is used by the muqallids and you will see them they will say he's a ghair muqallid he's a ghair muqallid this is used as a mock word a hate word it's a slander so first of all we the ahlul hadith they don't accept this type of slandering as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran wala tanabazu bil alqa that do not call one another with bad names allah mentions this in the quran so those people who call us by these names they're going against this these hate names or these you know slandering words they go against quran and the sunnah secondly for those who have studied ilm al mantiq ilm al mantiq is a science which is taught in the subcontinent Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he wrote a book called Ar-Raddu ala al-Manatiqah this book was summarized by Jalaluddin al-Suyuti and has been translated into the English language it's very dear to buy it's almost a hundred pounds Ilm al-Mantiq is something which the ulama have detested that a person should not learn and some of the ulama they see it as a waste of time but there was a time where there was a need for certain scholars to have learned that science and from amongst them was Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah and from amongst them was Sheikh al-Islam Abu al-Wafat Sanawal Amdi Tsari who was an Imam in Ilm al-Mantiq I studied Ilm al-Mantiq when I was in India before I became Salafi and with regards to Ghair Muqallid this title of Ghair Muqallid which the Sheikh says is like a swear word towards us then you need to understand that in ilm al mantiq you have naqid and naqid ali so for example naqid is the opposite of something and the naqid which is the example which is on, always commonly given in contrast to explain how naqid and naqid ali is used is the example of two colors black and white they say that the opposite of aswad is abyad and the opposite of abyad is aswad nobody from the 
scholars who talk, talk from uh, the scholars of ilmul mantiq nobody says that the opposite of uh what is it aswat is ghair aswat meaning abiyat nobody says this so they will never say that the opposite of aswat is ghair aswat or the opposite of abiyat is ghair abiyat if you were to use that as an example they would laugh at you so constructively the opposite of muqallid is not a ghair muqallid based upon the principles of mantiq you can't be a ghair muqallid just like you can't be ghair aswad can't be white it's either aswad or abiyat so this murakkab or tarkib of these two words rationally are not correct constructively are not correct now we say that the opposite of muqallid is a muttabi somebody who makes ittiba of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so this is really got to this word ghair muqallid which the sheikh mentioned which is a swear word which is used towards us and we reject this in fact i said to one of the scholars once i said that uh, those who are not upon the salafi methodology and who are not upon the way of ahl al hadith and they translate the ghair muqallid as non conformists this is how it's translated in the english language as i have seen non conformists uh, the ulama have given these this group uh, this his that we see in the subcontinent in india particularly is we call them the brothers you know and uh, they all dress up like zakir naik with their blazers and their white hats and their shirts and their trousers none of them have studied anywhere none of them can even read the arabic language to be really honest none of them are endorsed by the scholars that we know but they go around lecturing and giving da'wa and they've memorized a few ayat and a few ahna references from the hadith and a few verses from the bible and a few parts of the the the, the indian scriptures so i said one of the sheikhs once i said that walaw kana sahihan i said if it was correct then those who only say that they follow the quran and the sunnah and they don't like calling calling themselves salafi not that they have a problem with the name that they have a problem with the manhaj or they don't don't like calling themselves ahl al hadith because they see that ahl al hadith is 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 iyadu billahi min dhalik it's like a sect like the hanafi shafis maliki and hanbalis then these are the ghair muqallids they should be called as non conformists but in reality they claim that they can they only follow the quran and the sunnah and they only go to the quran and the sunnah but they don't go back referring it and uh, they don't follow the quran and the sunnah according to understanding of the salaf now these are these brothers that you get the uh, sheikh miraj jabani said to me once when you've called me he said I call them the brothers group. I said, "Naam, they are the brothers hisb." Uh, Juhala uh, have no real knowledge and their da'wah is in the English language. This is one of the reasons why the ulama have instructed me to travel to India uh, to call to ad-da'wah to salafiyya uh, in the English language and to explain to the people who understand the English language uh, from them amongst them the academics as well as those who may, may speak the english language to explain the salafi da'wah in the english language in comparison to what a lot of these brothers are doing so the word ghair muqallid is a word which is not correct constructively not even correct according to ilm al mantiq it's a swear word which has been used and we don't accept it if somebody ever calls you ghair muqallid is just like insulting us as well as the word wahhabi as we know is one of the names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, which is also used as a swear word in which ahl sunnah wal jamaa are um insulted and they also say that we are la la madhhabiyya we don't have a madhhab now we do have a madhhab our madhhab is the way of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam no so then the sheikh continued to say he said that the issue of taqlid is an issue which has been disputed or oh, it's a thing which distinguishes al-hadd al-fasil is the word that the sheikh used 
He said that al-haddul fasil, or that which separates clearly, explicitly, without any form of, you can say, doubt between us and the Hanafis, you can say the Barayalis of the, or the Ubandis of today, is the issue of taqlid. Is the issue of taqlid. In which component? In the second component of the first pillar of Islam, which is the shahada wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. But we say that it is not obligatory upon a Muslim to blindly follow one of the four Imams. And they say that it is obligatory upon every single Muslim to follow one of the four Imams. So by this, we, the, the madhab of Ahl al-Hadith becomes distinguished. That one of the landmarks of the madhab of Ahl al-Hadith is that we, the Ahl al-Hadith, reject al-taqlid al-shakhsi or al-taqlid al-mutlaq. Uh, of those who taqlid al shakhsi sorry of those who particularly blindly follow a particular imam it is for this reason that the sheikh when he was writing this book he said that I felt that when I was writing this issue in this book that I should have wrote this issue in great detail but because I was writing this book concisely just to explain uh, our madhab and explain our usul and our manhaj, I fear that if I dwelled into this issue, this concise book would have become voluminous and it would have sidetracked me from the main issue. But he said, I will present to you some of the ayats of the Qur'an and some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and I will mention to you those principles which are accepted by all the scholars of Islam as well as the scholars of Sufi. The first ayah which the Sheikh mentioned in refutation of our taqlid from the Quran is Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number three, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min Rabbikum." وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَا That follow that which is revealed towards you from your Rabb and do not follow other than that and do not make follow those other than that that will be your friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned another ayah in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 31 where he said قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, O Muhammad, that if you love Allah, then follow me. Then surely Allah will love you and forgive for you your sins. So in both these ayat, what we notice in the Qur'an, that in the Qur'an, the words that have been mentioned for us to follow are ittiba, and we've gone through the definition of ittiba in our previous lessons. The definition of what Ibn Abdul Bar said, what Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal said. The other word that has been used in the Quran is ita'a or ta'a. Obedience. The third word which has been used in the Quran is iqtida. Ula'ika alladheena hadallahu fabihudahu muqtadi. Iqtida. So three words have been used in the Quran. Ittiba, iqtida, and ita. The word taqlid has nowhere been used from the beginning of the Quran till the end. From Surah Al Fatiha to Wan Nas, the word taqlid has not been mentioned anyway. We find that the word taqlid has only been mentioned in the Quran in one surah. In the beginning of Surah Al-Ma'idah, and the word taqlid has been used in its linguistic meaning. Where Allah says in the Quran, "Ya ayyuha al-ladina amanu, la tuhillu shaa'ir Allah, wa la shahr al-harama, wa la al-hadya, wa la al-qala'id." 
talking here about the animals which are tied around their necks the leashes that are tied the qala'id that are tied around their necks so has been used in the linguistic sense also we find that the word taqlid has not been mentioned anywhere in the entire um compilation of the ahadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also we find that the word taqlid has not been used in the era of the companions except that they dispraised or disparaged or discriminated those who blindly followed and from amongst them is the famous statement of muadh ibn jabal which has been reported by imam waqi ibn jarrah in his kitab az-zuhd with a sahih sanad where he said that for amma al-ali muhtadi fala tuqallidhu fi dinakum that even if the scholar that you follow is rightly guided do not blindly follow him in your religion so the sheikh rahimahullah presented two ayats of the quran the sheikh rahimahullah he used two ayats of the quran and then i elaborated and said to you that there's ayats in the quran which talk about ita allah says may yuti'a rasul faqad ata allah that whoever obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned in the quran where he says laqad kana lakum fi rasulillah uswatun hasana that indeed for you in the messenger of allah there is a great example uswatun hasana the ulama they say that uswa means qudwa and qudwa is from ittida someone who deserves to be followed and i mentioned to you another ayah where allah talks about those who were upon the right path allah says ulaika alladhina hada allah fa bi hudahu muqtadi they are those who allah rightly guided so follow them qtida that follow those who have been rightly guided so the word iqtida has been used again So one thing which a lot of brothers and sisters when they make a mistake they say that we don't blindly follow any scholars or any of the imams but we blindly follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam let it be known that you can't blindly follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you can't make taqlid of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is a grave error you can only make ittiba you can only make ita'a or ta'a and you can only make iqtida of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you cannot blindly follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the reason for this is is that when we go back to the definition of at-taqlid defined by the scholars themselves the scholars of the madhahib and all the scholars of the madhahib they agree that the definition of at-taqlid is al-'amal bi qawl al-ghayri min ghayri hujjah But to act upon the opinion of another without knowing its evidence without it being based upon evidence or knowing its evidence min ghayri hujja the word hujja that has been used here refers to quran and the sunnah and the ijma of the ummah so you can't make taqlid of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you can only make ittiba that's why the ahlul hadith they say that those who adhere to the madhab of ahlul hadith they make ittiba or they are muttabi of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are muti of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are muqtadi of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are not blind followers of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam um the sheikh then continues to say he says that there are many ayat in the quran which refuse the concept of at-taqlid the ayat which have been mentioned in the quran are two which the shaykh gave as an example which is surah al-a'raf ayah number 3 and surah ali imran ayah number 31 the shaykh rahimahullah then goes on to say he says that there are so many ayat in the quran which clearly and explicitly initiate the concept of hasr 
in the Arabic language. The concept of hasad in the Arabic language, hasad in the Arabic language is to restrict. For example, the hasad of marrying four wives at one time. That the number of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has restricted a man to marry is four wives, up to four wives. The hasar is four, within four. One, two, two, three, or four, as mentioned in the ayah. And if not, then one. So hasar is something which is restricted. The shaykh said, so many ayats in the Quran give the, the idea or the concept of hasar that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the only one that should be absolutely followed. And then the Shaykh said that, let me give you a hadith from Al-Bukhari. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that, لو كان موسى حيا ما وصعه إلا اتباعني That if Musa alayhi salam was alive today, there would have been no other option for him except that he would have had to follow. This is what the, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said with regards to the noble Prophet Musa alayhi salam to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to directly without any barrier. So this is what we find that the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, but the fanatics of the Hanafi madhab, and I'm talking about their scholars, I'm not talking about the, the laymen. The fanatics of the Hanafi madhab are mentioned in their books, Ruddi Mukhtar, Durr Mukhtar, and others, that when Isa alayhi salam descends back, to this earth, he will return back and he will blindly follow, be a muqallid of the imam known as Abu Hanifa. He will blindly follow Imam Abu Hanifa. To this extent that the muqallids, the blind followers have gone this far, that they see that Isa al will come back as a blind follower. To the extent that they say that there is a sunduk, a chest, which has been put away. And when Isa a.s. comes, he will find this chest. And in this chest will be the ikhtilafat. As they mentioned, the ikhtilaf, as in the Arabic language, ikhtilafat in the Urdu language, of the four madhabs. And if you shall be manic hambalis. And Isa a.s. will open that and he will judge between the madhabs. And each time his judgment will be in favor of the Hanafi madhab. And then he will say that the Hanafi madhab is the best of all madhabs. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that if Musa Alaihi was alive, he would have followed me, made ittiba of me. And the Hanafis are saying that when Isa Alaihi Salam descends, then he will be a blind follower of Abu Hanifa. And Ibn Abdul Bar, as he mentioned, he said, لا فرق بين المقلد والبهيمة. Abdul Bar, the Spanian, the Bukhari of the West, he said that there is no difference between a four-legged animal and a muqallid and a blind follower. So this is what the Sheikh he said that if Musa alayhi salam was alive, then Musa alayhi salam would have had to follow me. And he said that if Musa alayhi salam had returned and had the people left following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and followed Musa, then even then they would have been led astray. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory upon the people to follow the Sharia and to follow Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is for this reason that when we find that when Isa alayhi salam will return, Isa alayhi salam will return as a follower, as a mutabi of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not as a muqallid of any madhab. Then the shaykh continued and he said that with regards to ijma and qiyas, analogy, 
the scholars have differed with regards to the hujjiyah with regards to it being a proof some of the ulama have said that ijma is not possible in this time that the only ijma that is considered to be a reliable ijma is the ijma of the sahab after the ijma of the sahaba they cannot be an ijma of the muslim um and this was an opinion which was accepted by the likes of shaukani and ibn hazm and the likes of abdul manan nurfuri and sheikh muqbil ibn hadi al wadi rahimahullah on this which is a strong argument that it's very difficult to say that they can all the scholars of the muslim um they say that the ijma that is valid is the or uh, is accepted according to them it's literally the zahiriya they reject the scholars is is has been like in shahad al fuhul in fact that we find that ibn hayyim of ibtal al qiyas on the issue of qiyas which is an analogy using analogies in the deen and giving analogy preference so the sheikh said that some of the people of knowledge have said that that ijma will only be considered an ijma which is in accordance to the ayats of the quran and the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if somebody claims that there is an ijma that goes against the hadith and the ayat of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then that ijma will not be accepted for example there are those who say that there is ijma of 20 rakats of salat at tarawih the ijma of umar ibn khattab radiyallahu anhu we say that they can never be this ijma can never be correct because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam never prayed more than 11 the action of the prophet sallallahu alaihi hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam thing ijma and qiyas is that you understand because this is how taqlid is practiced he said then some of the people of knowledge have given the following condition. with the gospel of qiyas meaning that these are the principles or the usul which the hanafis have agreed upon amongst themselves that the qiyas that qiyas will only be accepted as qiyas an analogy ila uh, far'in many that analogy will only be the maqis or the text that can be found ala kulli hal that which is important for the student to understand and if he understands this point it is enough for him that qiyas is only practiced where there is no text evidence from the quran and the sunnah that with regards to ijma amongst the scholars are that ijma is a proof after the quran and the sunnah but some differ that the ijma is only the only ijma that we accept is the ijma of the sahaba after that for ijma to ha- happen they say it's it's impossible those who adhere and then there are those who completely reject qiyas like the zahiriyah and many of the scholars of ahlul hadith like badi adin sindi al rashidi rahimahullah and others they say that with regards to this example of the cigarette and the onion and the garlic is that there is proof that the proof that you are basing the judgment of the cigarette there is text to back it up although you are doing qiyas they say we don't see this as text in the quran and the sunnah the hadith from the usul they say that i can exercise it 